Welcome to the Center for Global Ethnography. I'm Sharika Taranagama, one of the co-directors of the center. And in this video, I'm interviewing Professor Heather Horst, um, Director of the Institute for Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. In this interview, Professor Horst talks about her work on digital life and using digital methods across a variety of projects from um, families in um, Sydney, Fijian fashion photographers, and um, uh, women in Trinidad and their, their digital lives. Um, in this video, she talks about these projects and she offers advice to graduate students in this current moment on using digital methods and on working on digital life. And she also gives advice on issues around ethics and confidentiality and how to treat digital interviews and other digital um, data. Hi, Heather. I was hoping that maybe we could start by you just telling us a little bit about your research. Sure. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, so I'm an anthropologist uh, who has worked largely on uh, mobile media and communication and, and sort of digital technology generally. Um, my work has been carried out in the Caribbean, Jamaica, Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and more recently in the Pacific, specifically in uh, Fiji and Papua New Guinea. But I've also done a range of work in the US and in Australia uh, with families and households here. So can you start off by telling us how have you used digital methods um, for ethnographic research? Um, so I've used a number of uh, digital technologies uh, for my research. I mean, because uh, the object of my research has often, not always, but has often been uh, things like mobile phones as well as digital media. Um, I've done a lot of work uh, that, that's sort of focused on objects and looking at kind of the way in which people uh, use these objects, the way in which they develop relationships with these objects. Um, and that often means a kind of artifact analysis or an object analysis of what they are. So it, it tends to mean, you know, looking at a person's mobile phone and, uh, you know, kind of going through all the contact lists, for example, that's one of the, the methods that we used in uh, uh, Jamaica and really kind of looking through uh, you know, what people, uh, the names people saved, how frequently they called the, uh, called the people in their phone lists and their contact lists, uh, how much money they spent, et cetera, on those. And those are really about the kind of everyday uses and, and kind of relationships with people um, uh, developed with these kind of new devices. Um, I've used uh, in my work in particular, um, as we uh, projects have sort of developed and I've developed more collaborations, I've used a lot of digital media and technology to maintain relationships with my collaborators. So I think probably uh, one of the first big examples of that was a project um, which was looking at the use of mobile phones on the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And we were really quite interested in the role of that kind of region, that the kind of placeness of that region and what that, that region uh, meant for uh, a lot of the Haitian migrants in particular that moved over the border on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. So that project involved a collaboration with Erin Taylor, who at the time had just uh, finished her PhD in anthropology at the University of Sydney, and I was at that point based at UC Irvine. And um, the project was really developed to kind of look at the way in which people were using those and the way in which the mobile phone was perhaps shaping uh, the, the forms of mobility that were taking place. So we had uh, interesting questions at the beginning about whether or not uh, people's use of the mobile phone or the availability of the mobile phone would actually uh, reduce the amount of movement that they were doing across the border or if it, um, the ways in which it would sort of enable them to do different things and different kind of jobs, et cetera. So with that project, um, uh, one of the things that sort of happened, it was uh, funded at the point where um, there was an earthquake in Haiti and that was uh, 2010. So it sort of inhibited all of our ability to kind of go to the field. So the way that we worked it out is that I stayed in Irvine and did a lot of the kind of administrative work to support that project. 
um, and uh, Aaron Taylor um, was able to kind of go to the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic to actually do the field work. And so what we did was actually in the beginning, as we were developing our kind of research and thinking about our our um, collaborative relationship and, and thinking about the project in general, we would basically use the phone every night to talk. So she would go and do her sort of interviews and do the kind of work we would set out an agenda. And then every night she would call me on the phone. Uh, you know, ideally it would have been video, but at that point the access and infrastructure wasn't uh, particularly great. So we started sort of doing that. So then she would sort of tell me what happened during the day. Um, um, it became a kind of analysis session. And then we would then set out a sort of set of things to do over the next day or the next few days. And then eventually, um, as she gained more internet access, things like pictures, other kinds of um, objects were sort of there. So that was really the first and the most basic um, of way, uh, ways in which we were starting to use digital media and technology to kind of develop um, these kind of field work um, relationships. And that's been something that I have continued to do. There's a project that I've been involved with in called Locating the Mobile that was looking at the use of mobile phones and digital technologies in families. And one of the things that we did was um, there were about eight of us involved in this project. So not everyone could obviously go to someone's house and sort of accost them um, at the same time. So what we did was actually um, did a sort of home tour um, in the first set of interviews that we did and um, basically went around and walked around with the person around their house um, looking at uh, the, digital, the, the technologies, the computers, the uh, tablets, et cetera, that they had around the house and actually took that. And that became something that was then shared with the research team so that everyone could kind of reflect on that. So the interview and the kind of interaction was done around those technologies at that particular point in time, but then it became shared. And then at the next interview, um, perhaps one of the other people um, went, I tended to go on the third interview. And so we had all of that background. We had sort of been to the house, so to speak, um, through the kind of video tour and then um, and then went through and were able to kind of build on those interviews. How are these kinds of methods that you've used shaped your research questions and findings? Um, so the first example of the way in which these um, kind of tools that I've been using uh, have shaped the research questions is actually, uh, again, that example from the Locating the Mobile project. So um, one of the things that came up is we wanted to kind of look at, um, we did a range of things on this project, for example, in the first interviews, we did the tours of homes, we then did sort of interviews with people looking at um, the way in which they use technology, how that sort of changed over the day and the different people in the household who kind of used it. And then through those interviews, the last set of interviews um, after we watched the videos after, and the tours and after we listened to those kind of initial transcripts, we then went back for a third interview. And in the third interview, um, issues of sort of privacy emerged um, as well as um, um, issues around kind of data and the kind of management of, of everyday sort of data. Um, but one of the things that was quite interesting early on in the research methods is that we, um, because of issues of privacy, uh, we basically had to, through our kind of ethics approval, um, agree to not interview people, to agree not to video their faces and to not sort of make it so that people could could kind of identify them through their faces. So what ended up doing is we have all these videos of kind of researching, you know, through the hand of people kind of taking the thing and scrolling through their things, doing that. And so learning around about kind of the relationships that people had um, pr precisely because we had that kind of restriction in terms of looking at the bigger context of the room is that we, we started to look at the kind of intimate relationships people developed with their devices. Um, so another example, uh, that I wanted to sort of mention is a new project that I've uh, literally just started in the past few months. And it's one looking at um, kind of, it's looking at the Fijian fashion industry, the role of uh, migration and diasporas and supporting it, the role of material culture, um, the role of kind of uh, the kind of production and consumption. And just as a, a just a 
by a little bit of background, uh, really since about 2008, Fiji has been developing uh, this sort of fashion and design industry. And uh, over the past probably four or five years, they've had multiple uh, fashion weeks in the capital of Suva. Um, and then uh, a lot of the kind of Fijian fashion designers are moving into places like Sydney and Auckland and London to kind of uh, show and share their sort of lines. So this is a project that um, has been recently sort of funded. I've been thinking about it over the past few years, obviously to write the application. And it was really a project that I had envisioned carrying out research in four urban centers around the world. Um, Suva, the capital of Fiji, Auckland, New Zealand, Sydney, Australia, and London, uh, where a lot of kind of fashion designers um, of Fijian descent are kind of showing their lines, etc. So it was very much envisioned as a place where we would go to an event, um, you know, like a fashion show or whatever in London, um, participate in the event and then follow up, you know, with designers and questions like that. Even in the past few months, um, it's been announced that Pacific Runway, one of the shows in Sydney that they normally show at is being postponed until 2021. Uh, um, London Pacific Fashion Week is being postponed and, the, and uh, Fiji Fashion Week has also been postponed indefinitely. And what you're sort of seeing in this is, um, uh, you know, so there's a point where, you know, I was kind of going, oh no, <laughs> there are no events to go to. What is this project going to kind of be about? And I started, of course, um, I've continued to kind of follow the various um, designers in their Instagram accounts and things like that. And they're increasingly doing things like stories. And one of the things that I've been finding is that they're actually using digital media technology much more intensively because that's really the only way that they can um, kind of develop a fashion week. And so they've been moving some of the things they've been having competitions, for example, uh, with fashion designers and people, um, people stuck at home in their houses, not able to go out dressing up and, and sort of displaying uh, their kind of uh, identity through fashion. And they've been holding competitions and, and uh, doing a range of sort of things to kind of keep the industry alive you know, the Instagram accounts and in digital media and technology was always going to be a dimension of this project in the kind of COVID moment. Um, it has sort of been the site um, for a lot of the designers as well as for me to kind of keep these relationships um, kind of going and to maintain the kind of ethnographic sensibility um, that I would like to, even though I cannot travel to Fiji at the moment. You are somebody who's not only used digital methods, but you also worked on digital life. So I wonder if you can tell us what kind of advice, what suggestions you would give for students, not only to use digital methods, but then what ways they have to think about those, that digital life, given that it's maybe, you know, it, what you're saying is that it's not exactly the same, or it has its own particular kind of ways and forms or, um, as, a, as a kind of mode of mediation. And also, could you tell us, because you touched on it in your last answer, what do you think that people should think about in relation to confidentiality, um, ethics, some of these issues that come up when using digital methods that perhaps they need to factor into any research plans that they, that they make? Oh, that's great. Um, I think uh, one of the first things that I, I think I would just sort of say to anthropology students is that one of the advantages of anthropology is that we actually, um, our methods are always meant to be iterative. They're always meant to be responsive to what is happening on the ground. We don't fetishize method, you know, that, you know, survey has to be done in a particular sort of thing. And that's the sort of basis of our thing. So all projects have these kind of adaptive moments in them, no matter how well designed, no matter how well um, someone thinks they know the particular site. Um, um, that's kind of important. I think in terms of, you know, what it's like to study um, or what's kind of specific about digital life, there's, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of work about what you know, I think, you know, Tom's Bell, Tom Bellstorff has obviously done a bunch of work on, uh, you know, kind of virtual ethnography and what's virtual and what's not. Um, but I think from my perspective and the kinds of work that I do, which tends to kind of be a hybrid between kind of the online 
work that you do um, and also the offline kind of contexts that shape the, that that are kind of mutually reinforced by both. Um, I think there's some interesting sort of techniques that um, people uh, can actually use to get that sort of sense of kind of participation and belonging, all of those things that, you know, really are captured in that kind of phrase of kind of being there. So, and, and, the, and with the methods are really, the methods are in many ways a technique to, um, or a route into that sense of sort of being there and being in the, those kind of worlds. Um, I mean, one of the things, um, you know, I've done some work looking at uh, young people and digital technology and things like games, et cetera, um, and also sort of online communities like fan fiction communities and so on. Um, a lot of the kind of first principles is just get involved, um, just kind of find an object and participate. Um, if you're interested in games, for example, um, you know, it, get involved in the games, get involved in the kind of fan cultures around games, inv get involved in uh, you know, volunteering to organize, translate, whatever your kind of particular skills are, just get involved. And even if that particular group that you get involved with does not become the, you know, group that you study, um, or in particular, it still helps you to understand how the, the rules of how those things work. So it's very, it's very similar to, you know, when you were, you would be doing ethnography um, and field work in a kind of physical <laughs> kind of place. One thing that's been really effective um, is actually doing something, you know, activities like diary studies. Um, so for example, um, I have a new project at the moment looking at um, uh, basically the use of um, automated recommendation systems um, like Amazon Echo Look, which is meant to kind of give uh, advice about what you should and should not wear. And so in that, um, uh, in that work, uh, the look allows you to kind of take pictures of what you're wearing and then you upload it and the system kind of gives you recommendations. And so one of the things that we've done in that project is to ask people to sort of send us the pictures of the outfits that they put on every day and also capture, you know, screenshot the feedback that people, you know, that the, the system gives and then use that as a way to kind of talk about, you know, what did you think about this system? What doesn't work? What does work? Whatever. So really seeing the diary study less as, as about the kind of accurate information, because the reality is that, you know, especially <laughs> depending on the group, you, you know, people will not remember to document every single thing that they do or do that, but it's a prompt to get them to kind of talk about the um, the uh, sort of aspects of their lives that often they don't account for or don't, you know, if you ask someone, you know, what did you do today, they will give you very, very general things. But if you kind of get more into these sort of specific, you did this first, then you did that first, and they can then talk about that, you know, through that process of talking about the minutia in a way that they would not normally do, um, then you start to kind of learn about their routines, for example, or you start to learn about their kind of perspectives and you start to see what's different or distinctive about those. So all of these kind of methods I tend to find are prompts and I feel like using a lot of them um, are, is really sort of useful. I think also when you're doing, um, I think when you are in these sort of spaces, so like that example that I gave with gaming, um, and getting involved in other kinds of games and other kinds of activities. So you just kind of understand the structure of how these worlds work. I think all of these things are just sort of a ways of sort of understanding and producing kind of credibility. And in when you are doing things that are digital, it's quite useful to have multiple things that you're doing just to kind of keep yourself engaged with people um, in the way that you would do you know, normally during kind of, uh, you know, physically based sort of field work. So it's a lot of it is just keeping keeping reasons to sort of stay connected and understanding what you're um, trying to learn through these different um, kind of methods and techniques. And I think the other thing is, again, just being very adaptive. Um, so for example, in the Amazon Echo Look study that we've been doing, we've been comparing Trinidad, uh, Trinidadians who use it and, um, and uh, American uh, women who are sort of using these, these systems. And we've found that actually uh, that people are much more responsive actually doing their interviews and being recorded on WhatsApp than they are going onto Skype or going onto Zoom and going onto those other things because they're sick of being on Zoom all day long um, at this sort of moment. So, that, you know, there's a lot of those sort of things that actually 
um, kind of getting at things in whatever ways you can and listening to people um, in terms of what they find easy or difficult or, you know, wh where they're, that that's actually more important than, you know, kind of keeping your methods pure, <laughs> I guess, in that way. Um, and then I think there's a, set, a question about the kind of issues of privacy and confidentiality um, in these kind of digital sort of spaces. And so there's a lot of things um, I think that, you know, there's one of the things that's amazing about doing work with digital media technology is there is just a volume <laughs> of work that, you know, so I can capture, for example, all the Instagram posts every single day, all the videos, all the sort of stuff. And there's a kind of, you know, what do you do with it? And I think, um, you know, you can archive, you can keep those, you can do. And in those cases, you know, I you know, I, I'm not particularly concerned about protecting the uh, designer because in fact, the designer wants the publicity and wants their sort of name to be known. So I don't do a lot of work to kind of hide their identity and those sort of things, but there's still a question about the kind of volume of work that's out there. And I tend to find that I might sort of capture all of those things, but actually writing a field note, summarizing it is actually, um, um, you know, what's happened, what I found, what the responses were, that, that sort of thing is actually way more important than trying to manage this vast corpus of digital <laughs> technology. You know, you're not going to use a thousand images um, and put it in a book or put it in a thing. You've got to sort of do that sort of analytical work. So I still think field notes um, versus trying to kind of archive and keep track of all that, the kind of data that's there is, is incredibly important. Um, in terms of the kind of issues around privacy when you're doing work, uh, for example, with the, um, the fashion and automated decision-making process, you know, obviously, you know, the things that we're finding and the people, things that people are sharing are, you know, their outfits, their bodies, their clothes, you know, they're talking about quite intimate um, kind of dimensions of their lives. And so, um, you know, really working with people as you would in a normal ethnography um, in terms of, you know, wanting to illustrate those in presentations and talks and in your, um, also just in your kind of uh, uh, publications and written material is really a, about a kind of negotiation about what people are comfortable with. Do you cut off their heads? Do you, <laughs> do the, you know, do you need these images to actually illustrate it or can you uh, describe it? Um, once in a while you need them, but really working with people um, whose work is, is sort of there. I think a lot of things around kind of hiding people's identity, learning the techniques of blurring faces, learning the techniques of blurring backgrounds, that sort of thing. But again, working with the people um, that you've been interviewing and working with all along to make those kind of decisions. It's not about the kind of ethics that you do with the thing when they sign off on that consent form, but about the kind of representation on the other end of things that are quite important um, with the kind of digital methods. And I think this is particularly the case in things like um, groups where people uh, write things and you want to take like those exact quotes. Those are very searchable um, online. People can kind of find them. Their identities can be revealed. Your networks can be revealed. And so you really need to be careful about making sure that they really, the exact words and the exact images, um, the exact things need to be shared, um, that it really makes a more compelling case or, or it makes, it, it really is illustrated of, of what you're trying to get at or ask yourself whether or not you can kind of capture that through your own uh, written kind of description, your own kind of creative representation of those sort of things. So it's quite tempting to use all of these sort of exact quotes, exact images, exact sort of thing to support um, the kind of arguments that you want to make, but often they're not necessary. And that's again why I often um, encourage uh, the students I work with to really use field work, use field notes rather than the primary examples um, as a sort of way of, of uh, working through this sort of material because ultimately it's your analysis that makes the difference, not the kind of primary material. So. Can I ask you a quick follow-up on that? Yeah. Heather, which is, what do you think is the difference between using some, you know, writing and communicating with people on something like Facebook, which is semi-public, but also directed. But what about WhatsApp chats, for example? Yeah. When, there's, when there's a group chat, do you have to get the permission of everybody on that group chat to reproduce? 
a part of that discussion or how do you see these different technologies um yeah and yeah i mean i think the rules around uh, technologies, you know, I mean, they are sort of, <laughs> they're morphing all the time, the kind of rules and morals. So I'm finding, for example, in the work that we've been doing in, in Fiji and Papua New Guinea, that people are getting much savvier about, for example, their privacy settings and things like that in Facebook. And it's becoming also a much more adult space than a youth space, etc. Um, so you see the kind of norms around that. So in that case, you know, when there's kind of individual, um, ownership of, of a kind of um, uh, topic, you can kind of um, work with that individual. Um, but there have been cases, for example, we've been doing an analysis of uh, looking at kind of the relationship between social media and politics in Fiji um, on this, and it's basically a news group. It's a very kind of public news group in Fiji. Most Fijians would sort of know it. There were two, there's now one, um, and we've been working with the, um, with the uh, person who owns the group um, about, you know, kind of getting permission to kind of use things again. But again, we're asking ourselves oftentimes synthesizing the discussion, talking about the things is much more important than those direct quotes and kind of conveying the key point. And so we need to think, especially because, um, you know, there are some, uh, you know, kind of media and regulatory uh, strictures in Fiji that really could actually put people at greater risk. And so we, um, um, you know, people could be accused of bullying or accused of gossiping about someone and could uh, be issued fines and other sorts of things. So uh, the, in that case, you know, it is a really kind of negotiated thing, depending on the type of the group, the type of the post, if there's images of people, depending on what the, the nature of what the content is that you want to use. Again, field notes, it's sort of fine. And there's a kind of question about, you know, do you need to keep all of these things into the longer term, et cetera? In, in the, we normally would love to, <laughs> but I think there are some questions about those kinds of issues, especially if you're working in a kind of sensitive area. WhatsApp groups, on the other hand, are really actually um, quite complicated uh, <laughs> kind of things because one, it's very, it's actually not that easy to get access to a WhatsApp group, especially, uh, you know, family groups, privacy, that sort of thing. So those, even that kind of negotiation of getting you in the group and people knowing who you are and that sort of thing is, is um, um, a bit, you know, it's a bit sort of different. Um, in the past when we've kind of captured those things um uh like with the load kidding the mobile project we had a lot of people who used whatsapp groups to communicate with family for example so obviously in that case we didn't join those groups because they weren't we weren't <laughs> members of the family and and it would be you know it would take much longer to kind of be given access to those but we would sometimes use the images and the images would be of the person that we interviewed who gave kind of permission but the context around those other sorts of things were often synthesized um, if there was a case where it was someone you know like so we had examples of people you know putting up one image someone putting a meme back someone else putting it when it was those sort of things we would um, ask permission with those things to use those in a publication and often it's not the publications as much as public presentations and things like that. So that's really about that ongoing relationship that you have with people. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's other things like YouTube groups, there's other kinds, I mean, each kind of particular platform has its own kind of ethics um, around it and own kind of norms that are being negotiated. And so you have to be, I mean, that that's the whole point of participating in it. You know, for example, I'd love to be off Facebook personally, <laughs> but I know for field work <laughs> and for my sort of thing at this, I need to kind of understand. So understanding how you're presenting yourself, understanding, you know, uh, Instagram's the same. I've got to be there because that's where the thing is. I have to be public in a way that I personally perhaps wouldn't want to be. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to make, in the past, we would have done things like set up a research account, my research Facebook account or my research Instagram account. That sort of um, uh, kind of dichotomy doesn't seem to be working as effectively anymore. People won't follow you. People won't respond to your comments or unless you're the kind of you <laughs> that they kind of, that they can kind of identify. So it's all of these things are um, really complex negotiations. I don't think they're any more complex than the ones that we navigate <laughs> in our day-to-day -day sort of lives doing field work, but I think that 
they have some kind of particular nuances, particularly the kind of searchability, the visibility of the kind of work that, um, that depending on the, the kind of scope of your work, um, uh, is, it can be somewhat um, problematic um, in that sense, in terms of the kind of, you know, people actually reading your publications, following up and being able to kind of um, do that in a way that um, they might not have before. Um, Thank you. That was really, really interesting. So I think actually, um, thank you for being part of this. And we, I've also learned a lot from what you've been telling us. And I, I think that a lot of graduate students will really appreciate watching this and learning more from you in this whole new era that we're now embarking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, thank you.